All right, so welcome to the Silicon Valley JavaFX user group. Um, I'm Steven, and here's Keith, my co-jug leader. Um, and we are very pleased. Well, I'll do the introductions of our speakers in a sec. We should probably talk about our meetup and do sponsors, and then we'll do meetup. So um, we meet bi-monthly. Thanks, everyone, for coming locally here at Redwood Shores. But we also get a lot of folks who watch online. So um, thanks to all the folks who are tuning in, um, either for the live broadcast or watching the recording. Um, and we have a bunch of sponsors. So Lino does hosting for us. Oracle gives us um, a nice venue to do, th do things at. Um, JFrog pays some of our meetup fees. And we have a bunch of um, licenses from IntelliJ we're going to give out, two licenses. Um, plus, we have a bunch of um, book companies which give us books occasionally, although no books tonight. OK, and without further ado, I want to introduce um, the JPro guys who are going to be presenting today. So Hans Henry and, um, oh, I'm, for, I'm forgetting your name already. Florian Kiermaier. <laughs> Flo I can't, Florian, I can't say your name in proper German. Sorry. Um, who are going to be talking about what's, what's a very cool technology. I think this will blow your mind away when you see what they're capable of doing with their technology. Um, especially for a JavaFX meetup, to see the um, the cool way these guys have of deploying JavaFX applications, I think it, it really changes the way you can use the technology. Okay, so without further ado, Hans Henry. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, yeah, my name is Hans Henry Sandbeck. I'm the CEO of uh, JPro Technologies. And um, um, one second, we need to give a password here. The screensaver was hitting. So, yeah, we will have uh, an introduction to JPro, which is a new product. Uh, which hasn't even been launched yet. It uh, was presented for the first time at Java one in September, and uh, we are getting very close to the first uh, launch. It's uh, today still in a beta, a closed beta phase, and we have more than 500 uh, uh, companies in, in our ticket system now that are uh, interested in using it, and I guess 10% of, of those guys are now testing it since a couple of months. So. Uh, uh, we are very exciting, excited and very uh, excited about the response which we have got from the market so far. So, uh, what is JPro? Um, JPro is uh, is a technology which makes Java run in the browser without a plugin, of course. So, we uh, we thought we uh, we can claim that we now filled the last gap in the Java ecosystem regarding uh, UI development. Um, the mobile um, Android and iOS is pretty well covered already. It's not 100% perfect yet, but it's uh, pretty well covered and we are using it in different projects as well pretty successfully. And uh, now it also works in the browser. So you can actually write one source code in Java, which now runs basically everywhere. Uh, so what, uh, what we have experienced that is that customers come to us and, and, and ask for uh, application development. And they say they want Android and iOS, which is a classical requirement, of course. And we can answer and say, OK, fine. We can do it with one team, with one source code. And it actually runs in the browser as well. So we will see that later, how we can uh, even simulate the uh, iPhones and the uh, tablets in in a browser development and have it uh, have the customer look at the nightly builds through the browser just by having a link so it's it's a very practical way of, of carrying a project through I think S so um, we think we are an enable for the Java development in total uh, of course uh, many many uh, companies today wants to do development with HTML and JavaScript, and we think we are a good alternative to that. Um, when you use uh, JPro, you can actually 
uh, have um, one team for the back end and for the for the front end everything can be done in java so. rvnu vadin many people ask us uh, about that um, the question is very clearly um, no we are not the new running unfortunately the the funny part was covered now by by the picture but uh, the answer is no yeah this is the no <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah so um, yeah, here are some quotes from our web page. We will take a look at the web page afterwards because our company web page or product web page for JPro is actually done in Java as well. It looks like a classical web page done in HTML, but it's done in Java. And those are just some quotes from it. We are, we are actually mirroring the scene graph of JavaFX uh, to the browser and, um, and um, then doing all the rendering in JavaScript. So that's the way, in one phrase, the way it works. And of course, there are there are a lot of challenges regarding um, uh, latency and 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 performance and bandwidth and so on, which we have had to deal deal with. And we invested a lot of work in creating interpolators and 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 uh, encrypting algorithms and zipping algorithms in order to make the bandwidth. Uh, or make the stream slim so that the bandwidth is, is not too, um, so we don't need too much bandwidth. So um, that's basically where the, the, the intelligence of the project is, is located, I think. Yeah. So if you now look at JavaFX or Java uh, at the uh, uh, ecosystem, uh, which we are dealing with. Then we have the Gluon, which is uh, probably known to many of you, uh, covering the mobile platform very well. The Android and, and the iOS, including using the RoboVM. And now the, uh, the gap uh, was, was then um, filled with JPro, and, and if you do, uh, do uh, interface development, with these uh, three packages, you can uh, cover basically all platforms. Yeah. So, how does the magic work? Um, I will talk a lot about the architecture today, so that you can hopefully understand what are the, the possibilities and what are the limits. Um, first of all, we ha here the we see the stack of JavaFX, which I'm sure you're pretty familiar with. Um, and what we actually do is we, we fork the JavaFX for the server because we let JavaFX run in the server and basically we take out everything which has to do with the rendering. So what is being left is, um, is then the API set uh, and uh, everything which has to do, do with the scene graph. So the, the JavaFX part running on the server is very, very slim, actually, compared to the mm. uh, complete JavaFX. Yeah, now we can go to the web page and see what, uh, mm. uh, what we have done there with, uh, with JPro to create a company web page or a product web page. So what you see here is is uh, the web page presenting JPro with several samples, and uh, what you see is all done with uh, with Java. So um, we have 15, 20, something like that, like that, different samples here, and we can go into one page, which is a typical e-commerce page. Um, which is not a finished e-commerce solution, it's a sample which we have created. But as you can see, it, um, um, or it's hard to, to, when you see this, to, to, um, to see that it's not really done with JavaScript and HTML. Um, it has the look and feel of, of the classical HTML technology as well. 
So this is one way of, uh, of uh, using JPro for creating uh, uh, browser solutions, but we also have very typical desktop solutions, um, and we want to show you one which we are familiar with, the so-called Scene Builder. And this, of course, has a to totally different paradigm in the user interface. And um, it's, uh, it's uh, a solution which we basically have uh, ported, uh, yeah, port <laughs> maybe the wrong <laughs> word, basically have brought to the, to the browser one-to-one -one without uh, really needing to change very much in the source code. So, well, it doesn't open. Okay, there uh, was a demo effect here. Yes, yeah, so the demo effect is appearing. Yeah. So that's pretty common. Um, then let's start the uh, the player. Mm, they running on the same server, so oh. I'm just opening. Yeah, we, we open a different one because the server seems to be down. Um, this is a game which we haven't changed at all, which we uh, was was free out uh, on the net, and we just uh, brought it to our JPro server, and it was running without any adaption work at all. So, and this is all all Java. I'm too bad. Okay. Back to the presentation. Yeah. Mm. So, let's take a look at the the slide which shows uh, how we are mirroring the the scene graph. Basically, it 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 um, it shows you how the the scene graph is is mirrored into the HTML DOM. And um, that is that is done in the way that we we only ch send um, delta changes from the scene graph. We are able to 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 update only uh, changes. So so what is actually sent between the server and and the browser is is relatively slim. So. Let's talk a little bit about more about the architecture. Um, on the on the top, you see the the classical uh, uh, requirement uh, that you want to have lots of different platforms covered. Nowadays, as a customer, uh, you have the iOS, you have the Android, you have the desktop browsers, and you have the classical desktops. That's more or less the, the world where, where I come from, that the customers want to have everything. Um, what we do here, we, we have a renderer which we actually have made available for any of those platforms. And uh, we are trying here to show how we uh, are serializing the scene graph from the JPro server, which can then run in the cloud, and to the different platforms. Um, and the... Uh, um, the next slide it shows you how we um, how we basically uh, set up the architecture in a in a in a way where everything is running on the server basically, which is not always uh, what you want. Uh, it's not always the preferred architecture because we have different options. But you see on the left side you see um, uh, uh, different desktop browsers. Um, having a renderer um, locally, and and, and uh, the next one is is uh, showing desktops, which can also have a local renderer with a JPro server running uh, with a JPro server running in the cloud, and um, the same with the Android and with the iOS, and actually that could be done with several other platforms as well. It it uh, with this architecture it would be possible to. If we write such a render, for instance, you could write Java programs which run on .NET. What we need, would need to do is to, r to write a renderer in .NET, and you can actually write uh, Java programs for .NET. So with this architecture, there is a lot of potential, which we haven't uh, all, all, all implemented yet, of course. 
Um, so if we go to the next slide, you will see a more uh, more uh, practical, more more common way of setting it up. You see uh, on the on the browsers on the left side there will be JavaScript renderers, uh, and and in this case uh, that has to be because. Uh, uh as opposed to the other platforms, there is no other option there. It has to be uh, a renderer available. Uh, on the desktop, uh, you can have them run natively, of course, which is would be the more common uh, requirement on Android and on iOS as well. But if you if you look at the the iOS platform, we have uh, here uh, uh, a native uh, a native. Uh one, but it could also it could also have uh, a renderer there. So what we try to show with this slide is that you can you can uh, typically on iOS and on Android you you actually have the choice. You can uh, you can implement it uh, natively. You can have it run natively, but you could also have a renderer running there. So which would mean. Uh, you would use the local browser on the iOS or the Android platform, and um, and you will actually have the, the the app running in in the server. So, uh, what we are trying to display here is that those dukes here they represent the the apps themselves, and um, you can have a set of JPro servers. Um, which would uh, uh, render the scene graphs of those apps, and uh, in the in the on the iOS device, you could have a local renderer, which is then serving the local browser. In this case, you would have everything running uh, centrally, as opposed to what we see here on the Android side, that uh, you can of course have it running natively, and in this case, you wouldn't. Wouldn't really need a JPro server, of course. Um, yeah. So, what what we are uh, trying to 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 um, communicate with these slides is to say that there is a lot of flexibility and potential in this architecture. We. Um, we have on all those platforms ex except the browser itself, because there you have to have a renderer. You have the option of having a renderer and letting everything run in the cloud, or you can let it run natively, all th uh, all with the same source code. That that is so to speak the the, sp the special uh, speciality about it. It can all be the same source code. Yeah. So. Um, if we look uh, at the next slide, we um, we take a look at the classical three-tier uh, architecture, which uh, I'm sure we are all familiar with. Um, the classical three-tier uh, architecture would work this way: that the the apps, in this case, they look like dukes. They will communicate with each other through the through the middle tier. Um, they will send requests to the middle tier. The middle tier would um, uh, s forward some of those requests to to the next uh, to the other clients. This is the uh, common way of, of or a very common way of setting up an architecture of a system today. Yeah, the middle tier would then uh, manage a lot of microservices or or REST services and and. and um, and, and the middle tier would uh, be uh, be the one which is orchestrating more or less the whole system. Um, with with JPro, it's actually possible to make the architecture much 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 simpler. You could push the middle tier uh, basically away and and let uh, and let uh, a small application layer, which uh, which is then a part of JPro. Uh, actually, take care of what the middle tier would, would normally do. So you become a, a very much simpler architecture with so with some pro and cons. Uh, the communication, which would normally be between uh, the clients through the middle tier, would actually then could actually happen then in the application layer itself. So if you have um, 
if you if you want to uh, create um, collaboration fu functionality for instance let's say a, a chat application then uh, it becomes very very easy to do and Florian has prepared um, a small chat application for us uh, here to show with with a very very short uh, uh, program very little source code he can create a uh, chat application with this architecture uh, because what uh, what you then need to program is just what here happens at the application layer is basically just the source code for this part. There is no communication between and client and, and middle tier, and there is a very simple uh, logic behind it because you you actually have a kind of shared memory between the clients with this architecture. So this has a has a downside as well. You, um, the other side of, is, of it is when you create uh, JPro applications and you, you let them run in a JPro server, then you must watch out and not use um, you know, static variables, for instance, and you you are not allowed to to have any uh, blocking uh, blocking source code in there, like dialog boxes or sleep commands and and so on. But if you if you use that correctly you can create uh, advanced applications with a lot of collaboration uh, in a very very simple way so florian will now show one of those uh, uh, examples that he has prepared to, to 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 show exactly what we talked about yeah i'm now going to show you some samples The first sample I'm going to show you is uh, um, scene builder. No, uh, not the scene builder. The YAFX example. Maybe some of you have seen this application before. It's basically the, sh the application for JavaFX to show all the different features which are supported by JavaFX. And this is currently running on localhost, but it's uh, running quite smoothly. And it basically shows that. Uh, mostly all JavaFX features are supported. There are some restrictions which are where obviously when you run it on the um, um, server it behaves a little bit differently. For example, file access automatically behaves differently because uh, now you've got a distinction between the, a file on the server and a file on the client. So it's this must be handled somehow. But um, can I Generally, most of the features are running out of the box, especially the ones which are specific to rendering. The rendering features are basically running automatically. And we didn't really have to adapt this applications. This is an application which was never supposed to run on the browser. So we could just put it without any big changes on the web. Uh, this is a small application which shows uh, a typically boring CRUD application where you can edit some tables. Um, it's only a small dummy application where you um, see some tables and when you select one of the ob objects you can edit them. And what's maybe interesting on set applications that it also shows how to integrate with existing uh, web technologies because this application is showing how you can upload an image for your own avatar because this is basically the own avatar and you can choose an image you're using for your avatar. Um, now I have to just find a good image. Uh -huh. And we've got another interesting feature in um, JPro, which is only ah maybe I can show you set first. Um, 
the rendering of Java um, of JPR is uh, really pixel precise because you will only find a very few differences. Uh, you can run JPR in an optional mode where you can still see the original Java X window. Usually we don't show that because we don't render the original Java X window, but for example for debugging it can be sometimes very useful, especially when you're developing JPRO, but also for showcasing it. And what I can do is I can overlap the two windows because the one window is the original Java X window and the other one is the browser window. Now I can directly overlap them. And then I can switch with Alt-Tab um, to look what are the differences in the rendering. And you can see so they are nearly 100% pixel precise. You see some small differences in the text rendering. Uh, the text in JPRO seems to be a little bit lighter and you see small pixel offsets. I think JavaX has the feature that it uh, snaps uh, the single characters to uh, to non-floating point windows, uh, non-floating point numbers. But that's basically the only difference you can see here. And, and because of the architecture of JPRO, because the application is running on the server, uh, the server still has the information of the application uh, and it doesn't have to send the information to only one user but it can also send it to multiple users. So we've uh, added a mode where you can share the same application between multiple users. So I can create a new tab and open the same application again. And now I've basic basically created a multi-user application where uh, you can share your session, maybe work together on something, uh, which is very helpful and it's an other difference to usually um, you sharing applications like TeamViewer because here you have a pixel precise application, you don't have this bandwidth limited quality. It's really very, uh, very sharp image you have, just like the original application. I think I give back to my colleague for some more slides. Okay, um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit of where we stand in the development process, how far we have uh, come now regarding uh, compliance with uh, JavaFX itself, for instance, because it's not, uh, not the case yet that we have uh, covered everything at JavaFX. So uh, here's a list of, if you start using JPRO now, um, of things which will not be 100% uh, as you might expect yet. Um, we have some uh, issues with the text input when you, um, uh, when you are using uh, different kind of keyboards uh, uh, in different countries. We have uh, some of the mapping is, is not 100% uh, according to what, uh, what JavaFX uh, delivers yet. That's something we'll be most of those things which I mentioned now will be covered uh, during the next weeks, most of them. Um, cut and paste is, is not as trivial as it would be um, with, uh, with normal uh, architecture, so to speak, uh, because here we have to take the, um, the uh, paste buffer and mirror it uh, uh, between the server and the, and, and the client. So there is a little bit to do there, which is not finished yet. It's also not too far away. We are talking about a uh, couple of weeks, I guess. Um, the effects of uh, uh, supported by JavaFX are not all implemented 100% correctly yet. Um, we haven't had many applications which uh, have been suffering from that because it's uh, 
there are more corner cases kind of uh, features which we don't uh, cover yet, but of course they need to be covered as well. So there might be some small differences in the rendering result uh, uh, today if you use, uh, depending on what effects you are using. Um, sorry, that was a screen saver. Um, the media view is, uh, or more exactly, uh, the media player is uh, not 100% uh, covered yet. Um, uh, but this is also one of those uh, uh, topics which are not so hard uh, to solve. And then we have two topics left in the list which are a little bit... Uh, more, uh, uh, yeah, to, to they require more work to to support the canvas 100%. -ly. That is probably not a couple of weeks away. Then we are probably talking about a couple of months. Um, and the 3D support is something which we maybe will never uh, support 100% as it is at JavaFX today. Um, what we uh, what we mean here is that. If you create a 3D user interface, uh, which is possible, of course, with JavaFX, then um, you won't, won't have the results that you have with JavaFX today. What is, is pretty close to be finished is that you can have a frame uh, in your UI which, um, which where you can have uh, 3D uh, or, or use all the 3D possibilities which JavaFX offer. That's not far away. But to have it mixed with the rest of the UI elements, just as you can do it in JavaFX, is probably a little bit further away. Uh, if we look on um, uh, on the uh, longer term uh, plans that we have there, then we are talking about going much further than what JavaFX can offer today. We will have an OpenGL support um, which will uh, allow for shaders programming and, and, and a lot of, s uh, lot of features that uh, I don't even think are planned in, in, in planned for in JavaFX today. So that would mean that you can actually have uh, uh, Java programs that drive OpenGL uh, from, from the server uh, with very powerful functionality. So the potential here is, is, is pretty large, uh, but it will, will not happen during the next weeks. Um, and um, the uh, project dependencies is something which, which is high uh, on our priority list because um, today you, you might uh, enter into some dependency problems um, if, uh, as long as we don't support class loader, uh, that you can uh, configure a class loader such that you can go around with us and get away with those uh, issues very easily. Uh, and of course, we would like to, to also have the possibility to run uh, the JPro servers on an application server. Um, so, so those those topics are are uh, are on the list and uh, are probably going to uh, be seen not not too far away. Um, down here, we have uh, more future uh, uh, yeah s features scheduled longer into the future. Um, as I said, OpenGL, multimedia support, which will go also also much further than, than JavaFX uh, has done today. Um, it will be possible to even write JavaFX um, compliant code, uh, which can support, for instance, different video formats than JavaFX support today. Today, JavaFX does not support so many video formats if you want to do development in uh, in um, yeah, more advanced development in multimedia, then you reach some limits there pretty quickly. Uh, there is a nice, very nice API in JavaFX here, but um, but there are some limitations which uh, you, not, you cannot always live with. If you, for instance, want to create a video editor, then you need to have support for more, more codecs and so on. Um, but here we, it will be possible to to use uh, uh, one of the concepts that we have in our architecture, which is to create proxies, actually, which run uh, on a on a which run remotely, 
so you can actually write JavaFX programs. Um, you will be able to write JavaFX programs, which um, which run uh, uh, yeah, which which are from the source code totally JavaFX compliant, but they will support different video formats in the browser, for instance. Um, TVM is an interesting topic because uh, there has been some projects out there uh, in the past. Uh, I don't know whether you heard of them, like Back to Browser, and uh, I think it's called something like Dopio, and there are different projects out there which have done interesting things in terms of uh, creating uh, virtual machines uh, written in JavaScript, uh, also with the goal to, to let Java programs run in the browser. Um, I think uh, most of the problems they have had are related to performance and a uh, little bit to, to the way uh, um, it, uh, they have approached it maybe. Uh, we have some ideas about how we can use uh, TVM together with our rendering technique and maybe have pretty good results on that. At least some of the tests have been pretty promising. So. That's uh, something which will happen in, in, in the future, not too far away, probably in this year, but uh, not during the next weeks. Cordova support is also interesting, of course, for the mobile platform if you run it with the renderer locally, meaning if you actually want to run it in the browser uh, on the mobile devices, then of course it's, it's nice to have, uh, have support for Cordova uh, so that you can uh, have an abstract interface to the different resources, uh, which are platform dependent, of course. Um, yeah, on the Java Pro tool set, we we um, we have an image here, which which is the server manager, which we are cur currently working on. So this will come along with with uh, JPro. Uh, when you use JPro, you will have a server manager, which is which is going to be relatively advanced as time goes. Uh, here you see one uh, from our designer, which has been done uh, in order to show and monitor an overview of the different servers that can be, be around. Statistics and uh, and reporting is is. Uh, is also some something which we are working on today. Uh, we have we have a tool set today which is coming along with J JPro, uh, and this is going to be developed further. UI recording is an interesting uh, interesting term. Um, we we have been uh, testing a little bit uh, uh, around the possibilities to to uh, uh, utilize this uh, architecture to in the way that we can record uh, UI uh, actions uh, in a way that you can actually do semantic search on it later on. Uh, you could record uh, everything a user has been uh, doing with the system in an introductory phase, for instance, to, instance, to see which parts of the user interface are actually being used, uh, which ones seem to be difficult to use, um, and, and so forth. And you can also create tutorials, you can record uh, th mm, how to, to uh, do certain things and then you can have a, re have a playback of it uh, later on to show uh, people how to use certain functions. Um, and it's going to be uh, working like, like a video recording actually, there will also be a video editor uh, or an editor uh, associated with it. Um, but it's uh, the format is so slim that you could actually record months of, of work from a user without any problem because it's not comparable to, to a video how much you need to store here. And because what we uh, would uh, um, save in, in the UI format here, the UI recording format is uh, are the objects and the actions themselves. So with this semantical information, uh, it's possible to do a lot of analysis afterwards, which you can do with uh, video recording, of course. S 
so that was just to give you a little bit of introduction to what what we are planning to do uh, for the for the next fu future and uh, just two words about uh, that's the last slide I think two words about uh, what we are uh, which projects are using JPRO uh, now or are in on the work now we have uh, some app development uh, projects which we have done for some local customers in in Germany uh, one is just a quiz app uh, that started the way that uh, as I mentioned earlier they came to us and said could you develop uh, an app for us and it should run on iOS and Android and uh, then we said yes we, we, we can do that and we can do everything with one source code and actually it would run in the browser as well so this is a project which is now being rolled out so so this shows that everything uh, is working and then we have a tennis app which we are working on today um, and uh, and a web portal shopping portal which is a project which has just started um, and then uh, we are working on an editorial system uh, for for uh, radio and TV stations in in, in Europe uh, everything using uh, JPro um, okay then we will go to the live coding so Florian will show you some of the applications as I mentioned For the live coding, I will start with a small uh, JavaFX or JPro Hello World application, I and I will make a small, minimalistic chat application about 40 lines of code. And if everything works correctly, I will at the end give everyone a link where you can chat with each other. So that would be the plan. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm starting with a, as a chat application, starts with a list of messages, uh, which basically contains uh, all the messages which were sent by all the users, which is in Java X an observer list, which is here backed by an error list. And for the user interface, I will basically um, add a small list view, where you see all the existing messages, and a text field where you can type in your text and press enter and it will be added to the list view. Um, okay. So let's write a small list view. Mm. And so the list view gets its contents from this uh, messages observable list. So whenever the, uh, um, this list is changing, also the list view gets updated. And we've got a um, text field. Which is just a text field and... Uh, no, let me first import all of them. And the text field has a prompt text like uh, your text message. And uh, the, the text field is uh, below the list view, so we create a, a VBOX. Where on the top is the list view, and at the bottom it's the text field. Uh, 
and we are limiting the size the VBOX can have. And also the width. And um, for the outer container, we use a stack pane, which is the root object from our scene. Um, stack pane, which contains the VBox. And we can put it into our scene instead of this Hello World sample. And now we should be able to run it. Yeah. Yeah, and the background looks a little bit um, boring, so we just go to Google and Google for an ambient image. I've got a small typo somewhere. I've got a nice um, uh, background, but I still can't type anything because I haven't set up the event for it. So the the text field has an on-action method, which gets executed when we press enter, which gets an event as an input. And to this messages list, we add a new string, which is the current content of the text field. And after that, we um, change the content of the text field to be empty, so the user has to write new content. Now we can write our messages and speak with ourselves. Now the funny part is I can now um, run that application uh, with JPro. And this messages list we were using is a static messages list, so uh, it can be shared between multiple users. So when I just open the applications twice, I can basically chat with myself. Oh, I'm very sorry. That information comes a little bit late. Yeah, yeah. Suppressor. 
representation more distributed group for it. in the full screen mode. Um, that was our original image. And now I can write to myself. Um, this architecture is obviously a little bit limited because it works only if you have only one server. So but for example, rapid prototyping or uh, special use cases can be very practical to have really fast results. And I've prepared a small script to uh, deploy that application the Oracle uh, Compute Cloud. And I've prepared a domain which has, which is used by the server. So this uh, script basically copies the uh, project to the server with the source file and the Gradle script. Um, we are using Gradle usually to uh, to run the um, what for the build tool for the shape applications, and we are basically just starting the same application now on the um, compute instance. And if everything is working, then I should be o able to open it. I'm hoping, yeah. Um, now is the time where everyone can open his mobile and go to the same application. I'm trying to make it a little bit bigger and put it to the screen. I'm already hacked because people are already accessing it. Yeah. <laughs> so it should be also working on mobile or on as you any other device. That's the live coding part. Any questions about that application? Um. Hmm? Uh, the question is, well, there are basically two questions. The one question is, uh, how do we handle scaling of the of the screen, and how do we handle scaling on the server side to handle more clients? Um, for the first question, um, ha uh, handling the scaling of the screen size, um, we are not really doing something special according to the scaling of the screen size. We are basi basically using the the features Sharp X has available. Um, to say it's simple, this isn't really a big problem. I mean, it's a GUI framework which ha has to. Yeah, re resizing the screen will uh, send our event back to the server. Yeah, and here I've, I've basically um, changing the size of the browser, so the browser sending a different size to the server and short time after I get a new screen back. And uh, handling the scalers on the server side, so for, for example if we have instead of a uh, hundred of users we start only have hundred thousand users then we get a problem because we need a second server because this approach is obviously uh, requires more servers than when you're serving static HTML pages because you really have a stateful session where you also have the same uh, UI on the server basically mirrored. So mm, usually we can just open more servers if you need more servers, so there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, say a stateful service in the sense that we can't uh, 
kill the old servers if they still have users, so we have to basically wait until they no longer have users. Or they are offline since a week, then we can also remove them. And um, for this chat application it gets more interesting because I've put um, the the chat into a static variable and the static variable is usually limited to the JVM or to the class loader. And this application must be modified a little bit to really run highly scaling. It's but it's showing how you can um, make rapid prototypes with the static variable uh, usage because it's uh, per server based and when you have a low number of users it can be very useful. For example if you make a small game server where you have uh, the views for player A and player B then you don't have to um, basically move everything to a middle tier server. For example if you would write something like Pong, Pong or a soccer game in Java FX, then uh, all the logic can be running on the same server in, s in some static context because I know I will never have more than uh, two or ten users per session so in that use case it would be totally fine and then I basically wouldn't have any real networking code Any further questions? What is the status of what? The status of the documentation is uh, is is not product launch level yet. Uh, that's that's uh, one of the reasons why we haven't launched yet as well. Because uh, what you see on 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 our web page is uh, is enough for 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 getting started, but uh, but there will be more to come. Uh. Um. I think something really worth to notice is that we are currently at close beta and uh, our webpage jpro.io there's a sign up page where you can when you put in your data we can give you uh, a key or a user account to use jpro and play around. Where, c where could we find um, could you find code samples? Um, some of the some of the uh, samples out there um, there are is no reason actually why you shouldn't get the the source code for them. So uh, um, I guess if you if you, uh, if you would just uh, send us an email and ask for it, then we could send it to you. At least for some of the small samples, for the scene builder and so on. Okay, that, that that's available anyway. But some of the samples are relatively big. Also, then it's and but um, uh, we we could find a solution on it uh, if you if you want them. A lot of the programs we are showing are also basically unchanged Sharpix programs. Mm. There's usually only a quite small part in the application which is really JPR specific. Especially at the beginning, because at the beginning uh, that's the great thing about the, the technology because um, you can already use existing applications and give them a totally new environment. So for these applications they don't really have to adapt anything. Uh, typically things which have to be adapted with things like file access or but that's usually m the only thing we are changing. So not all samples are written in Java, okay. There are other JVM languages also which have been used like Scala and so on. Uh, what what exactly are you interested in knowing? Uh, 
Um, well, I, I think I, I think it's uh, it's it's it goes too far if I try to explain that right now what we are planning there. But uh, there are challenges. Yes, you are right. There are challenges. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for coming all the way. Farthest. Thanks for coming all the way from Germany to present at our user group. Um, so, like I said, they they have a really cool technology. Um, so, coincidentally, do you remember? Do you guys remember the the keynote, the Oracle keynote when um like the first Java one after Oracle took over? And they announced that they would, they would port all this stuff to HTML, get a J HTML version of JavaFX. Um, we never did it, <laughs> but these guys, these guys have successfully pulled it off. So it's very, very impressive technology. Um, give it a try. And also, they showed it running in Oracle Cloud too. Um, so not only have they 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 did what we couldn't do, but they did it on our platform, <laughs> which is very cool. Um, oh, okay. So Keith, Keith, Keith wants folks online to post their email address in chat if they'd like an IntelliJ license. Well, you you guys will get one too. You you guys will get one too. Okay. So for folks watch, for folks watching on the live stream. Type your type your email in chat quickly. Okay, and um, we're gonna do further giveaways in the room, but I'm gonna stop the live stream. So for all the folks watching the recording of the live stream, thanks very much for joining us. Um, Keith will respond in chat with who was the lucky winner of the IntelliJ license. On our roadmap before the release, there's one feature which is basically missing here, which might make it a little bit difficult to write the email address because we currently have 